You want to fold it over or something? Yeah. Uh, this is Jerry Hess from the Hess Institute in Aurora, Colorado. And this is a paint drawing of where my client has tenderness with palpation. I believe that she has two problems. She has had a microdiscectomy, had an annular tear, and some of her symptoms might still be coming from that disc, an inflammatory condition affecting the nerve root because she does get symptoms that go down to her big toe. She's had lots of MRIs, um, but strangely of recent they were suggesting that she get her sacroiliac joints fused. Now the second problem is with her sacroiliac joints and what's bizarre is that they're proposing fusing these joints and her sacroiliac joint is completely stable. In fact, it's stuck and it doesn't move. So I'm going to have her line her back. I'm going to avoid getting her face in the video. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate how she has a complete lack of movement through the sacroiliac joint on both sides. When I try and glide the pelvis to the left, there's absolutely no movement. Well, this is a very fit 62 year old woman who has been active all of her life, has excellent range of motion in the hip joint, um, full extension in the hip joint, um, full movement with a scour test. But when it comes to the pelvis, I cannot induce any posterior rotation on either side. There's just no give whatsoever and I'm using more force than what is typical and there's no side glide going left to right either. I'm going to have her lie on her stomach now. I'm the cameraman as well as the clinician. Okay, good. All right, so we have a good view there. There is absolutely no superior glide spring mobility. And if you look at my other YouTube videos on the sacroiliac, you'll see where I demonstrate mobility with these spring tests. But there's absolutely no movement available. And I'm pushing with a moderate amount of force, you know, much more force than is typically needed for inducing motion here. I'm on the flat part of her ischium, no give. I'm on the sacrum and I'm testing inferior glide no movement there. I'm testing backward bending, none. I'm on the top of the sacral base, S1. No forward bending. I'm on the middle of the sacrum, no anterior spring. I'm on the upper ilium, absolutely no give in anterior rotation. And the same is true on this side. And here is inferior glide of the ilium, no give. Um, the sacrotuberous ligaments, are right here and I'm trying to indent it and it feels like bone. The ligament should have a little bit of give like a tight nylon rope but it feels like bone. Um, positionally my thumb is on her left on her right PSIS. This thumb my right thumb is on the sacrum. The sacrum is posterior in relationship to the PSISs. Typically it's anterior and when you come off the PSIS you fall into a sulcus onto the sacrum. It appears as though the sacrum is wedged posteriorly and I see this type of injury. It's a pattern I discovered long ago and it happens in response to a fall on the buttocks and it appears that maybe the SI gaps and the hyperflexion of the trunk pushes the, the weight of the upper body right through the middle of the SI joint at S2 and wedges the sacrum posteriorly. What I do know is that there's no lateral mobility of the, of the um, ilia and I submit that if that biomechanical model is accurate then both ilia move into what's called an inflar. 
And I do know that by treating her with a two inch by four inch by eight inch foam under each ilium, okay, on both sides for five minutes, and then coming and pushing on the middle of the sacrum, encompassing S1, 2, and 3 for five minutes, restores this passive, normal joint mobility through the pelvis. Okay? Can we blame it all on the nervous system and say that muscles hold this pattern throughout the pelvis? I don't know. I'm aware of the controversy of the SI literature. I've followed it since 1981. Very aware of what's out there. So my very statement is very controversial. I get it. Um, if this is PSISs, that would make me at S2 level. So one thumb width would put me at S1. And then one thumb width above that on the midline would be L5. And with this pattern, I never find movement at L5. And I'm trying to spring L5 and there's no movement. Okay? I'm coming up to four and now we get movement. Now I can load. I can load that structure to an endpoint, and then I can spring it, and there is movement. And that's true all the way up her spine. Okay? Now, I, I recognize patterns, and with this pattern of pelvic restriction, I usually find a restriction at the T3-4 junction, because reflexively the body appears to hyperextend there, and the body hyperextends in the upper cervical at the atlanoaxial joint. She has excellent upper cervical mobility. I can traction her in neutral and in flexion and in extension, isolating the upper joint of the neck. So she's out of pattern. She's not the typical presentation where there's this whole body rigidity, um, in including T3-4 uh, and upper cervical. It's, it's moving beautifully. So I'm a little bit perplexed, but this is where my thinking is. Um, and again, I want to state that I think there's two problems. I think one is that part of her symptoms may be discogenic. And we'll see how she responds to my treatment of restoring pelvic mobility. It could be that, that this tractions all the dorsal nerves of the sacrum and adds to a lot of this hypersensitivity here. Um, we'll only know by trying to treat her, okay? Um, but she and I will have a conversation later on seeing how she responds to restoring movement in the pelvis and it might be that um, additional intervention to the lumbosacral disc uh, is in order. Now, for many decades she wore high heels. Can I have you lie on your back? So I wonder if she developed restrictions in her ankle. Now when I dorsiflex her, I can take her just slightly beyond neutral and I would expect in her body type, I would expect 15 or 20 degrees of dorsiflexion. So both sides move equally up into dorsiflexion but again probably probably five degrees maybe or less. Okay and so what I'm going to do is, and I'm wondering if, if her body compensates here in the ankle for that posterior sacrum. So part of my treatment is going to be to mobilize the, ta the uh, talus posteriorly and um, I'll, I'll demonstrate that right now. So I clasp the calcaneus and I traction it inferiorly and towards, I'm, uh, towards my nose. I'm bent over, okay? So I'm pulling the calcaneus up, down, and up, okay? And then I slide down uh, the foot right onto that talus. And then I oscillate it firmly, pulling and pushing at the same time. And I'm going to do this 30 times. And then I'm going to come up and I'm going to oscillate the tibia and the tibia moves well so I don't need to worry about mobilizing tibia. Okay. We made a distinct gain in mobility. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and treat the other side. Um, and I think the reason her upper cervical did not reflexively go into hyperextension was because this uh, was part of the compensation. This was already in place, 
but it acted as a compensation for that pattern. All right, so I already dis discussed how I'm going to treat her pelvis. Again, I'm going to have her lie on her stomach with foam placed underneath each side. I'll have her lay there for five minutes. I'll have her lie there for an additional five minutes, at which point I will also add anterior pressure, just mild, about 15 pounds of force onto the sacrum. So I will stop filming here and I will treat her and we'll come back and film the response to treatment.